very topical actually because Canadian Innovation News, the issue April 18th just came out, is about female STEM leaders, science, technology, engineering, math, uh, are rising to the highest levels of politics and power. That's the title, and in there is a but, just like you have one here. Uh, but there's still problems and still challenges. So it's kind of cool, very topical, and I'm delighted that this is our sixth, sixth uh, brown bag this term at the Prentice Institute, which I think is a record. Yeah. So first thing we got to do is tell you that there's a sign-up sheet. If you want to be informed of what's going on with Apprentice, you can put your name and email on this and pass it around. We'd love to see you multiple times. <coughs> OK, so um, Jennifer Mather is going to talk to us about women in science. And she has a lot of data, demographic data. So this would be fun. She's a professor of psychology. And her main focus is animal behavior. So she's got this double barrel thing, women in science and animal behavior. But because she's a scientist, she knows a bit about this. She grew up in Victoria, where her seashore explorations led to an interest in ocean animals. And many of you know that she's an expert in octopus, like really an expert in octopus. Now, who would think that would be at the University of Lethbridge? But she's been yes, in National <laughs> Geographic and featured in various I have had people things. say, why are you with Lethbridge? Well, me too. They say that to me too. That's a separate story. Um, okay, so then she uh, she pursued a doctorate in psychology at Brandeis. She was the first female professor of psychology at the U of L, and uh, is co-founder of the Gender Issues Committee for the uh, for the Faculty Association, and served a term on the CAUT Status of Women Committee. Um, she's been also recognized as a distinguished researcher in 2010 and a distinguished teacher in 2017. So she's got the bases covered here. There's a lot more to say, but I don't want to do all the talking and want to hear her talk. So we're very grateful that you would come and talk with us today. Thank you, Thanks, Susan. She'll talk. She'll talk about 45 minutes. And then right, so I have to questions. keep an eye yeah. out. So. Good. Okay. Or scheming or whatever else you want to do. Well, the subtitle of this is Glass Half Full and Glass Half Empty. And the half full comes because really there has been a huge amount of progress at getting women into science. And the glass half empty, as Susan said, is that while there's been progress at getting women into science, there hasn't been an awful lot of progress on helping women be senior, taken for role models, doing what people think of as important work. So we got in, but let's see what I've got here. Okay, so of course I want the glass to be full. Now, when I was trying to look at what's happening to women over the past 50 years, frankly, I had an awful lot of trouble, even with Stats Canada, getting data to talk about the sweep of what had happened to women in those 50 years. This is women in the paid workforce. And to some extent, that reflects women in the science workforce, except there are not that many women. And I thought, well, what the heck? Why don't I give a couple of anecdotes? Because I've been around for a while, and they may show you about the progress, OK? I went to UBC in the 60s. And I was an undergraduate in biology, and I thought, hmm, I think I took a couple of these aptitude tests. And they said, you want to work, help people, and you want to do science. And the person who explained this said, well, it seems to me you should go into conservation. So I thought, OK, so I'll go into conservation. There was a postgraduate program. I don't think it was a master's. I really don't know. But I went to get an interview with somebody who was running the program, and I said, I'd like to go into the conservation program. And he said, oh, you can't do that. We don't take girls. What actually followed up by saying, which is so ludicrous that I, it annoys me, he said, we have to go out camping. We have to go out in the wilderness. Girls can't do that. And I didn't have the forethought to say to him, look, I've been doing that my whole childhood. What do you mean I can't do that? I was meek in those days. So I went away. And I married, which I planned to do. And I had two children. 
one of which was planned. And then I went back to graduate school into more traditional academia five years later. So I actually was specifically blocked from being in conservation. In some ways it's okay, but it wasn't okay that that happened. And so I did a master's in Florida and a PhD in Boston. And in the mid, early 1980s, NSERC was worried about finding jobs for all the new graduates coming out. It sounds very funny, because anyway. But they said, you know, everybody hired people in the 60s, and we have to worry about the people who are coming out with PhDs in the early 1980s, because we, need, we, we know we're going to need them later, but we can't get them now. So they had a university research fellowship program, and that was a five-year, essentially a junior researcher program. And so I worked at that for five years in Western Ontario, and then I interviewed and got the job here in 1985. As Susan said, there were no female professors of any status in the psychology department in 1985. I knew that, they knew that, okay. And when I was hired, you know, I was kind of a pioneer, I suppose. And there was no other female professor in the department for another nine years. Interestingly enough, that was despite the fact that at least two-thirds of the undergraduate students were female. The profs were male, the students were female. And somewhat after I'd been hired, one of my friends from another de department said, oh, she said the psychology department swore that they would never let a woman be shoved down their throat. Oh, that's nice. To be fair, I didn't have any problems. Several of them were very, very supportive and advocacy of me, and the others were just normal array of professors. So that might give you some idea of where we've come from. Nobody would ever say, now you can't go into X program because you're female, and nobody would ever say, even if it were <coughs> true, nobody would say that the Y department swore that they'd never let a woman be shoved down their throat. So times have changed immensely, there's no question. But even there's been remarkable progress, there's still an awful lot of progress to go. And it is unconscious gender biases, basically. It's not that science is biased, it's us, the society. Now, if you look at this, I, I did find some. You can see that at the college level and at the university level, the proportion of women in scientific occupations has increased immensely. On the other hand, this might give you a clue as to what's going on later because you can see that at the college level, we've got over 40%, and at the university level, we've got over 25%. So clearly at what we think of as the lower level, there's a much bigger increase for the proportion of women. And this is another one that I could find looking at female university degrees in the natural sciences and engineering, and you can see the nice looking green is the bachelors, and you can see that it's gone up from about 32% to about 38%. I don't know why it's lower between 2007 and 2014. And also the PhDs are going up. So there's absolutely no doubt that the proportion of women in the sciences in terms of being students, even all the way to PhD, has immensely expanded. But now, when it comes right down to it, in science, the Nobel Prize is the absolute epitome of success and pioneering and how wonderful and the dark green is men, and the pale green that you can hardly see is women, um, 48. Now I did actually dig a little deeper. You notice, by the way, in literature and peace that the women aren't there. There's no doubt about it. But in the sciences, physiology, medicine, physics, economics, chemistry, that's one woman in economics, by the way. So they're not at the top. That's about the only way I can say it. And by the way, I checked, and I think it was seven blacks and five Chinese, or maybe the other way around. So the epitome, the Nobel Prize, 
is going to white men. There's just no question about it. And why is a good question. Okay, if you look at the gender differences in the US in terms of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and management, you find that in science and technology, there's a difference, but not a huge difference, okay? Engineering, very, very, very big difference. Engineering is male. And math and computer science, also, it's male. And these are the graduates from university. If you look at the full-time enrollment 2011, see, I've told you about the past. Women weren't there. So this is, okay, women are there, but. So you can see in the life and physical sciences, there's a reasonable proportion of females in engineering in Canada. There's not a reasonable proportion. And in math and computer science, they're really not there. So it's clear that the more physical the science, the more male it is. Now there's a prize award called Canada Research Chairs, which is given all across Canada. Obviously, there are two levels of it. Okay, so tier one, two hundred thousand dollars a year for seven years to do research, and tier two, one hundred thousand dollars a year for five years to do research. And Susan was a tier one, right? And the disproportionate number of men and women who got these chairs immediately stands out. Clearly, there's about 16% women at the tier one, which is the higher prestige, and 29%, 30% for tier two, which is the lower prestige. So if we think that we're getting women into full participation in science, this suggests that we're not. Now, I have to be fair, University of Lethbridge actually has equal numbers of men and women, but that's not true all across the country, okay? So the people who are getting the opportunity to do cutting-edge science are mostly men. And I spent some time with the Office of Arts and Science, actually, very kindly, Jackie Rice helped me to figure out these figures, because pretty well everybody knows, but I'll remind you, Instructors are people who teach labs, people who assist with teaching. They are not usually researchers. So they're status-wise, they're the lowest level. Then the level, quote unquote, of status rises from assistant to associate to full professor. It's really interesting to think about because the higher you get, the shorter your title, which is kind of fun. And if you look at all the positions, you see that right now we have 25% female science department members are female. So we're not doing all that well. But then it, it's much more interesting to look by rank because then you see something that jumps out at me and jumps out at me for the research chairs as well, which is that there are 19 male and 15 female instructors, okay? So the lowest level of prestige, the person who's likely to get the least access to doing independent research, are about 50% female. And then you work your way up, and you find that the proportion female shrinks the higher the status. Um, actually, the assistant professors is an anomaly. But this is kind of worrying in terms of the future because we kind of take it for granted that people come in as assistant professor, people like David. Did you come in as assistant, David, or did you come in as associate? Assistant. Yeah. And then presumably you work your way up the hierarchy. But the mythology of the last couple of decades has been we have lots of females at assistant professor, and they will move up the hierarchy, and they will change the low representation that we see at the professorial level. But that's not going to happen in our science department because at assistant professor we have 11 males and two females. So it doesn't look like anything is going to happen very soon in terms of getting women into higher positions. Oh, by the way, psychology is not in here. Psychology is a funny area. We're half social science and half science. And I thought, well, just let's not touch it. 17% of full professors the people with the status, the people with the seniority, the people with the research grants, 17% female. Um, 
And there's a particularly graphic representation if you go down the sixth floor, eighth floor hallway, and you go by the geography department, and they have pictures of all the department members. And there's a fair number of them. Anybody from geography? And what do you notice when you look there? There are two instructors. They're female. There are, I think it's 10 full professors. They're male. It's, it's unfortunately graphic representation of the distribution of influence and supposed competence. Eek. Now, of course it matters how much money you get. There's no question about that. But there is, if you look in biology, chemistry, physics, and astronomy, and this will be US numbers, there's a gender, gender gap in pay in all <coughs> the sciences. But depressingly enough, in biology, which is what I started out in, it's not too bad in terms of a gap, but it's the lowest pay area in the sciences, okay? The more prestigious the science area, the higher the pay, the lower the pay for women. Hmm. Hmm. And by the way, because we do so many different jobs as university professors, we end up emphasizing different things. Women are supposed to do a lot of teaching, right? The result is it's very, very difficult to evaluate the gender gap in pay. And we did have somebody try at U of L about 15 years ago. When there were only a few women professors in my faculty, and by the way, Canadian Association of University Teachers used to publish these numbers. And I could look at the mean pay for the female professors and the mean pay for the male professors, and it was about $5,000 difference, and nobody ever did anything about it. It bothered me, but what do you do? Okay, I really am going to talk more because this is demographics. I'm really going to talk more about data and figures and not very much about what's behind it. On the other hand, you really should think about these things as being behind it. This is psychology, but this is also where it comes from. So why don't women go into science and why don't women become senior scientists? Motivation, interest, expectation, family work balance. These are the internal things. So a woman who's looking at a scientific career might be thinking, can I really do it? She might be thinking, oh, physics is so boring and quantitative and dull. She might be thinking, will I find a husband who will marry a scientist who wants to spend her whole life you know, in astronomy, for instance? And that does matter. And she might be thinking, and quite validly, that if I work the kinds of hours that university professors work, will I have any time left over for family? So these are the things that go into young adults' expectations. It's too bad I've got a bunch of young adult women here. I'd like to ask you all. Maybe I can, I can ask them after when we've got time to do discussion. The other influences are society-wide and also psychological, which is that there are biases. We don't think of, in 1978, which was actually when I got my PhD, somebody published a paper about how women PhDs thought they were seen. And they were seen as boring and unattractive and uninteresting to men. If, if you know that's happening, and if you know that's how you're seen, it, it's a little bit difficult. It's also difficult if you think, well, do I want to be seen like that? Or do I want to find something fascinating and gorgeous like modeling? And I was mentioning stereotype threats. Was it you? So it was with somebody. If the stereotype of a scientist is male and the stereotype of somebody who goes into, say, health sciences, that would be good, actually, or goes into preschool, daycare work, if the stereotype is, gee, I like science, but I'm a female. Wait a minute, I'm not supposed to like science. So after a while, there's a lot of pressure to sort of go with what you're supposed to be and not go into what you're not supposed to be and not be the kind of person you're not supposed to be, okay? 
So the stereotype of males and females has a big influence on what careers we choose, no question about it. And cultural influences. Fascinatingly enough, I was able to find a paper that looked at about, I think, 20 different countries. Olu would love it. And it turned out that the proportion of women in science varies tremendously across countries. Okay? And it turned out to correlate very nicely with gender equality in the particular countries. Okay? So our culture is actually fairly stereotyped and fairly patriarchal. I would say much more after we've got Trump in the presidency, but that's a different issue. Okay. So all of these things influence men and women making decisions about what they will do with their lives. We can't pretend it doesn't. Okay. The, the demographics help us to see how it plays out. And the answer to when it begins is it begins at birth. I, I was actually talking in developmental psychology one semester about how we have different expectations for toys for our children. And one of the men in the class said, he said, yeah, you know, when my son was born, I went out and bought him a football. I mean, the kid was just a little bit bigger than the football, but this was his expectation, okay? Our families, our peers, our schools, our teachers, they all begin the pressure to be what you're supposed to be. And that pressure continues lifelong, continues in elementary school, continues when you talk to your high school counselor. I don't know if high school counselors still say, no, you shouldn't go into physics because you're a female, but they did for a long time, okay? And then when you go to university, of course, one of my friends, I guess it was about 15 years ago, so let's hope it wouldn't happen now, okay? He said, came to me and he said, Jennifer, I said, yeah. He said, my daughter went into math in high school, I think, 10th grade, and he said she was the only girl in the math classroom. And he said, the teacher looked at her and said, oh, a girl. Well, you won't do very well in this. Girls can't do math. The, the nice thing about this was the connections, because I knew Rick Morazic, who was working in science education in the education faculty. So I went to Rick and said, Rick, what do you think of this? And he said, what school? And so I went back to my colleague and said, what school? And Rick went to the principal and said, your math teacher is saying something that he shouldn't be saying. And the principal went to the teacher and said something to the effect of, hey, listen, don't do that. So it was very nice to have had the connection. But if we hadn't had the connection, that young woman would have felt that she couldn't possibly be a mathematician. Girls can't do math. Okay. Parents, media, peers. I think I took out a lot of this because there's not an unlimited amount of time. But if you look about, and someone did a study in the US of science shows, and this was, the PBS type science, science show, okay? And they looked at males and females appearing as scientists. There were more males being shown as scientists and the males were shown as superior and the females were shown as young and attractive and beginners, okay? So this is, and, and the media is pervasive. It really, really matters. When I talk to my students in my human-animal interactions class, they often say, where I learned about all this was from the media. And so this is what happens. The other thing I thought was screamingly funny was that they said that the only difference between the behavior of the males and females is that the males were depicted as more violent. I don't know many violent scientists. We're really nonviolent types, and the idea that on the media you were showing male scientists edging into violence was very strange. Okay. Now, one of the things that I found in my reading is that when you ask parents whether their boys or their girls are smarter, they say their boys are smarter. And I found another, and admittedly this was the U.S., but I don't think it's any different when asked, when undergraduate students were asked whether male students or female students were smarter, they said males, especially in science. And so I was 
preparing this in summer, so I got in touch with somebody from institutional analysis and said, can you find the overall grade point average for male and female U of L students this year? This is graduates, I think. Okay. How many of you think the females were higher grade point average? How many of you think the males had higher grade point average? You're right. Statistically significant, even with a much smaller number than 9,000. Um, the women's GPA, 2.94, the men's GPA, 2.77. One thing I found really fascinating because I work mostly with third and fourth year students is most of my students wouldn't want to have a GPA of three, even though that would be, so they have expectations of 3.3, 3.5, 3.7. So I was actually astonished that the mean GPA was so low. But there's no question the females are doing better, but everybody thinks the males are doing better. That's a little bit depressing. Okay, and so I was digging and I thought, well, let me look at the U of L awards. Um, now, admittedly for faculty, there are more males than females, but that's not true for other things. So the honorary doctorate is people out in the world that we want to show our good, our role models, our important people. They come from everywhere, okay? Um, sure, 23% of them are women. <coughs> so we're sending an explicit message to our graduates that men will be doing more, doing better, being more important in later life. When I looked at the distinguished, what, what astonished me is if you go one, two, three, four, you go down those first four, right? It's about 20%, a little bit over 20%. So the best researcher of the year, four-fifths male. The distinguished teacher, this, this is a little bit just surprising that the distinguished teacher has been so much male because females are supposed to be more teachers, better teachers. Distinguished alumnus, again, a little bit over 20%. The only one that differs is the volunteer award which is given to staff for supporting the activities of the university. I, we're awfully gender stereotyped. Okay, I wanted to mention this bit about the men being better at math because in fact, when Hyde started looking at this about 20 years ago, there were clear gender differences, particularly for the higher scores in math. Over a couple of decades, it shrunk this would be a glass half full thing, by the way. And there are now essentially no differences between males and females. Now, one thing that tells you is that it's got to be effort and recognition and not talent because our gene pool can't change in 20 years, okay? So that means that it was much how we evaluated and how we encouraged and how we believed in people, not inherent talent. Okay. So this is, I'm going to bring this one back to the research chairs. Equitable cultures, equitable achievement, okay? And one of the things these people found is that the proportion of women in parliament influenced the extent to which the society was egalitarian. And so there's Canada. 27% of women are members of parliament. That's not very high. On the other hand, Trudeau did something very interesting a couple of years ago. He made half of the cabinet ministers women. And one of the cabinet ministers is Kirsty Duncan, and she is the minister for science. And remember the disparity in number of research chairs that were male or female? Um, people went to her and said, gee, this isn't a good idea. And she said, oh. basically she said to the universities, you know, if you want to be a participant in the research chairs programs, you better do something about getting people besides white males. Previously, there had been complaints. There had been people who said, no, this isn't fair, okay? And what Kirsty Duncan said is, put your money where your mouth is. And this year, I just saw on the CAUT bulletin, there were 24 re new research chairs. 14 of them female, 10 of them male. 
and four were visibly minorities. I don't know whether there were any others who were minorities that I couldn't see from a picture, okay? So by being the minister and by saying to the universities, you better change this, she has made a difference. So this suggests that they're right about women in parliament, senior women in parliament, being the people who are going to help get the change. The change isn't just going to come from the bottom up, it's got to come from the top down as well. Oh, I find this one depressing. If you look at the critical point at which you're going to get into science, in, as a profession, a professional, a professor, or whatever, okay, it matters hugely what you've done in graduate school. And most of this is American data, but it's pervasive. So someone evaluated the letters that professors wrote for male and female PhDs just graduating so that they could get a job. And they found that the language of the professors for the male students was, oh, he's going to be a winner, he's going to be uh, you know, the head of a research team, he's going to be all focused on his professional ability. Whereas the letters that they wrote for females were about, oh, she's going to be a good research team member, she's, yeah, she gets along well with people. In other words, they actually described them differently. I don't know if they were different, but they described them differently. Um, what's that? No. Th this was a really interesting study, actually. It was a pervasive study through the U.S. They looked at the elite universities. There really are elite universities, like Harvard and Princeton. And they found that the senior professors in the elite universities, the people who were the leaders of the scientific establishment, took on many more male students. Okay. So every university isn't equal for graduate school. But if you went to the cream of the graduate schools, chances are pretty good you'd be male, okay? Um, and now the first one of these four, writing with a male name is evaluated better. Um, one of the journals that I sometimes write in and sometimes read, Behavioral Ecology and Sociobiology, you know it, David. They decided about five years ago that they would simply take the names off the papers that were being evaluated for publication, period. So I don't know how well this works. I mean, if, if somebody reads my work, it wouldn't matter if it didn't have Mather on it because they know what I do. But, but for beginners, it can make a huge difference. And then about three years later, they evaluated, and I found, they found just not having the names on the papers increased the proportion of published papers by women 8%. That's a tiny thing, and it made a solid difference. Yes, and then male teachers are related as better. Um, yes. This is, this is depressing for women, because we're supposed to do better, but on the other hand, males are rated as doing better. And in fact, the Faculty Association just put out a, I don't know what you call it, a memorandum quite recently saying, student evaluations of teachers are flawed. You should watch out for thinking about all of us as being equal across the evaluations, okay? And some of these things anybody who's been through undergraduate would know. So if you have a course at eight o'clock in the morning, you get a lower teacher rating. If you teach statistics, you have a lower teacher rating. <laughs> <laughs> if you have an accent, you have a lower teacher rating. If you have a non-white face, you have a lower teacher rating. And if you're female, you have a lower teacher rating, okay? Um, and it's, it's a real challenge, by the way, to figure out how to do this. And do I have two minutes to explain the design? It's, okay. Or yeah, okay. So they had a distance course taught by a male and a female, two sections each. They put a male name on one of the sections the male taught and a male name on one of the sections the females taught, okay? So in the end, they had four sections with student evaluations, and they looked to see if there were any statistically significant differences. And there was a statistically significant difference between the male names and the female names. 
Not the male people, the female people, but the male names. That was a neat design, I always liked that. In effect, in the science field, women <coughs> start behind because of these things that I've mentioned. And they stay behind because they get pushed to teach more. It's harder. MIT actually did a study. They, they, they said MIT couldn't possibly be discriminating against women, but they thought, well, they said, okay, well, so we'll prove it. And what they proved is that they were. It's harder to get research money. Somebody in the UK worked it out, the difference between a woman's record and a man's record in terms of getting the equal grant evaluation was one paper in nature or science. Oop. Less workspace, one of my friends found this. So when a woman comes into the science professoriate, she's already behind because of all these things I mentioned and she stays behind because of administrative decisions. Now we talk in this area about the leaky pipeline, imagining that say 10 males and 10 females come out with a PhD and they are ambitious to go into the university workforce, get tenure, have stability, get research grant, go on with their life. Married fathers find it fairly easy. Single women, about the same as married fathers. Married women who have children have much more trouble. 35% lower odds to get a tenure track position, 27% lower odds to get tenure, that's not nice. And the reason is something that's pervasive in our society without anybody thinking about it at all. We just do. We say having children is women's work. And when a man and woman have children, a lot of men contribute some, but we talk about the men helping the women. We don't talk about the men having 50% of the effort. And, and this is really clear to women in science. So if you look at it, fewer women scientists than men scientists marry. Fewer yet have children. I think it's something like 50%, whether married or not don't have children, and that is quite different from the non-science workforce. Someone worked out a careful calculation and they said, if you have a child and you're female and you're in academia, you're going to find a 10% drop in productivity, which probably measured the number of papers because we don't have any other way to do it per child. So it, it, it's kind of put up in front of women's faces. You want a kid? Fine, you won't do very well. And there's a cynical phrase that we use. Happy marriage, beautiful children, successful career. Pick two. I'm really being cynical, I'm sorry. Um, there's a lovely paper I read called May Babies and Post-Tenure Babies, okay? And what they said is before there was parental leave, which there now is in Canadian universities, and by the way, there is not in American universities, which is astonishing when they think about how they pride themselves as being the leaders, that when women couldn't get parental leave, they'd have babies in May, okay? Because then that would give them the summer to get through the first four critical months before they quote, had to go back to full-time work. Now that women can get parental leave, they wait until they have tenure. <coughs> now the problem with this demographically was something that it, I would presume stands out for Susan, which is that by and large people get tenure mid to late 30s. And the peak fertility for women is 18 to 24. So sometimes women do wait and then they find that they can't conceive. And then they have all sorts of expensive things they have to do to try. In other words, pushing women scientists back to their late 30s to try to have babies may result in them not having babies. And no, I don't have this for scientists, but I don't honestly think it's particularly different for women scientists than it is for women in the labor force women in the labor force are far more likely to work part-time. 
they're likely to have care for seniors, they're likely to have child care, they're likely to have domestic chores, and it's not shared equally between men and women. There, of course there are exceptions, and in fact my husband was one of those exceptions. He made sure that he was a full partner in the child care process, but it's not usual. Which leads us with this comment. Yes, the glass is half full. Women are getting into science. But the glass is half empty. We're not taking our rightful full part in the process. Okay, I left some time for questions.